Uh, good morning to all. Uh, and it's actually, uh, I'm really excited uh, that uh, we are having this program here in collaboration with World Bank. I'm really grateful to World Bank, especially uh, Dr. Martin Rama and Dr. Robert. Um, so this is an event, actually, we uh, dreamed it about for long, but now it has become a reality. We're expecting a few other uh, participants and speakers too. I think they will be coming. So we can start. So let me give you very briefly the kind of background uh, of this event. So Sanem is a leading think tank in South Asia. Uh, actually, we were established in uh, 2007. And this year, we celebrated 10 years of our journey. And we have been doing uh, quite a lot of work on uh, regional integration, trade issues, economic growth, uh, SDGs, labor market, and other issues. So uh, one of the niche areas of Sanem is that actually we emphasize quite a lot on uh, quantitative research, quantitative economics research. And so we want to promote uh, this quantitative research uh, and the evidence-based policy making in South Asia. So uh, we have been doing a lot of activities in South Asia, but uh, this is the first time we are holding this event, uh, this kind of event in North America. And as I said at the beginning, I'm really grateful to uh, World Bank for that. So here in this uh, program, uh, you can see it's actually the theme we have mentioned that uh, South Asia at the development crossroads. So what we felt that there are few challenges uh, in the South Asian countries where we actually need to think and uh, seriously look at and uh, try to find out the major, uh, you know, whether we can find better solutions to those challenges. So in this context, we have four sessions uh, in today's event. Uh, the first session will look at the growth the challenges related to growth acceleration and growth maintenance. Then we have a session on trade, uh, especially linking uh, emerging issues on regional integration in South Asia. <coughs> then, of course, the SDGs, which is very overarching kind of uh, uh, linking or having, you, know, uh, you can't really ignore uh, or nothing, no issues left out in the SDGs. So we'll look at that. And then finally, I think this is something also very, a bit of excitement to me that. Uh, for uh, some of you who are not aware of this, that there is an event we conduct in South Asia, it's called South Asian Economic Students Meet. Actually, this is an undergrad <coughs> students uh, annual conference. Uh, we started in 2004. A uh, few of the leading department, economics department of South Asia, they started the journey. And actually, it has been now 13th event. Uh, you know, we have been able to do it. So what happens, uh, so the students from all the leading South Asian economics department, they come, they meet, present their papers, and then they compete, and then they exchange the ideas. So this is an excellent platform. And actually, again, I'd like to thank World Bank, and they have been very generous in supporting that event for the last uh, you know, few years. So that session, the last session actually, we bring uh, some of the Sesam alumni, uh, who are actually now pursuing their higher studies, or have already finished their higher studies and now, they are actually, a couple of them actually as a faculty in uh, different universities also doing other, uh, engaged in other activities. So that is the last session. Uh, and then uh, actually, you know, with the World Bank, we would like to, uh, actually the whole idea of this event is not to make kind of very conventional type presentation. Actually, we'd like to, why don't we spend our time and put our effort to brainstorm the kind of cutting edge and emerging issues related to the topic I have mentioned in different sessions. And they, that will really help us. Actually, we have also come all the way from South Asia to learn from you also, whether, you know, what are the new challenges in development research, and what areas we can look at. So this is something we'd really like to see throughout the whole day. And I really, you know, again, thank you all. You know, I know many of you actually come from very long distance. And, you know, it has been a wonderful experience, I think, you know, when you responded to our request to participate in this event. I really, I'm really grateful to you. So with this, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Martin Rama to say a few welcome words, and then we'll get into the next session. Thank you, Suleiman. Uh, thank you all for coming, for joining uh, these one day of discussions. Um, I'm very pleased to serve as host and, and to be helping, and we we we'll be very interested throughout the day to listen to your conversations and to learn from you. So we, uh, we are interested in doing so for several reasons. One is that 
South Asia is a region where there is a lot of local capacity, local research, and people who are coming and going to uh, universities in, in advanced countries and elsewhere have uh, a lot to share. influence ideas who are opinion makers is extremely important. I think the more we help strengthen that technical capacity, that ability to provide to all these political forces that sometimes makes changes difficult to provide strong, solid, uh, trusted, consistent advice is very important. So in each of the countries, uh, helping in a way people like all of you have a space, have an opportunity to discuss your ideas is very important. And it is important beyond the countries themselves to have people who trust each other uh, despite being from different countries and despite the sometimes complicated and nasty politics between the countries that can talk to each other and perhaps disagree on an identification strategy for a paper and don't disagree on the fundamentals on what the development takes is also very important. So we have been supporting, and uh, we were trying, of course, it requires for us to mobilize funding. It's not always certain that we succeed, but we are trying hard to be able to engage in a, a long-term way with all these networks of the South Asia Economic Students Meet, the Sun, and, uh, and others, and also to do that in other areas. In a way, this is a group of modelers, uh, policy researchers, and advisors. We do the same. With doing the same with human development, with power sectors, so in other specific areas, so that if we can help, if we can build a community that is strong, trust each other across the country, and that we can learn and have stimulated exchanges with you along the way. So I look forward for a, a, a great day uh, of discussions that will be throughout the day uh, with you listening, taking notes. Uh, and uh, please engage, please make the most of uh, this opportunity. I always enjoy, I must say, I particularly enjoy the South Asia Economic Students Meet. There is so much energy. <laughs> I hope we will have a bit of that flavor here, even if there's a more seasoned crowd in, in somewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, uh, can I bit of, have a uh, quick round of interest? very briefly, that can actually give us a bit of uh, understanding who, who are we. So from this table, Rohin, you can introduce uh, very quickly. Yes. Hello, uh, just press. Yes. Um, this is Rohim. Uh, I am a graduate student at uh, University of Unibi. I'm doing environmental resource and development economics. So I am about to end my degree. So, and I am here to um, attend that uh, Sunim North American discussion from, which is a great event, I think. We will have it together. Thanks so much.
Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Abir. Um, I finished my undergrad and uh, master's from Dhaka University of Economics in 2010. Um, I've been living in Canada for the last four years. I finished my MBA with a finance concentration from University of Ottawa three years ago. And I've been working as a business banking analyst for TD Bank uh, in Jason, Ontario. Hi, I'm Fatan Zumara. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the University of Ottawa. I did my uh, master's and undergrad from Nagar University. I also worked as a research associate in science. Hello everyone, my name is Nusrat. Uh, I'm a third year PhD student at Carleton University and, and I also did my undergrad and my master's um, uh, from Dhaka University Economics Department. Hello, my name is Maria Philip. I'm a program assistant working on the Salvation Portfolio at the Center for International Private Enterprise here in DC. Hi, uh, this is uh, Abu Yusuf. Uh, I am uh, an economist by training. I am teaching in the Department of Developer Studies, holding the professor and chairman of the department. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, this is Maruf. Uh, I am a faculty of the Department of Development Studies. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Farooq Subhan. I'm the president of the Bangladesh Enterprise Institute in Dhaka. It's an independent think tank. Uh, earlier, I'd served as 35 years as a diplomat in uh, the Foreign Office of Bangladesh. In November 1979, I wrote the concept paper for SARC, and I've been deeply involved uh, with the whole process of regional economic integration now for almost 40 years. So anyone interested in the history of regional economic integration, I'd be happy to chat with you. <clears throat> and why we've made such slow progress. <laughs> Hello, I'm Ravi Agamara from the Trade and Competitive Women's Group uh, Practice uh, Foundation. Morning, uh, my name is Bogdan Konstantinescu, senior FMS. Uh, I'm also acting uh, practice manager for Financial management, which is part of the governance uh, cluster. Hello, I'm Xiao from the uh, World Bank Global Trade and Competitive Practice, actually, on South Asia. Personally, curious on how to improve the supply chain integration between Chinese and Mexican delegation and the local private sector. Good morning, everybody. I'm Marcio de la Cruz. I also work in trade and competitive is a global practice in the bank. I'm happy to be Shao and Mr. Ravi. I'm very happy to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Muntu Mazal. I'm doing my PhD at the University of Virginia in economics. I did my master's from Williams College under Fulbright Scholarship. And I'm a student of uh, Dr. Selim Raihan. And I was one of the participants of the SAGEM that we talked about. I participated twice and I organized in 2009. That was the last time we organized SAZM, South Asian Economic Students Week in Dhaka. And um, yeah, we have been thinking about this. We have been talking it with Dr. Celebrant for a long time. And finally, we made it to DC. And it's great to be here and looking forward to a very productive week. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Mila Hemmerwood. I am uh, currently a PhD candidate at uh, Albany. Uh, previously, I did my bachelor's and master's from the University of Dhaka. I was uh, a great student of uh, Dr. Sinvayan, and I joined Salem. It's my first uh, employment, and I'm uh, grateful to be back uh, to uh, find Salem again. I'm uh, looking forward to it as well. My name is Abdullah Shibli. I'm here I'm known as Abdul, simply because um, when I first came here, they found it easier to pronounce my name that way. But in Bangladesh, 
and known as Shibli. So Salim probably called me Shibli Bhai, um, which you do for um, elders, elders. So I have the honor of being, or have worked with the same institution, graduated from the same institution as Salim. I'm a big fan of Salim. Um, I worked most of my life here. I did my undergrad at University, great Hatton University, and making a plug for that. Everything I learned in my life in economics. I did my PhD at Boston University in economics, um, and then moved to um, the private sector. Um, I am an IT professional, but I never lost my touch with economics and Salim's Sanem always attracted me because I do a lot of modeling. Um, CGR, um, CGE, when it was the um, computer generally fully model, a um, couple of my friends were very deeply involved. And so modeling is my um, big passion, even though I know the limitations of modeling um, and I critique modeling when people don't use modeling or give it the respect, which is respect its deficiencies and the assumptions and the parameters and just selling it to policymakers without any caveat. And I want to add, am I a practicing economist? Yes. I write a regular column for the Daily Star, which is Bangladesh number one. English language newspaper, and they are kind enough to publish these in, I'm making a plug for my book, this is volume one, essays is, economics is fun, short essays for the masses, Kiman Dhaka, the honorable finance minister, Mr. Mohi, was the chief guest, and so were my two friends, Dr. Hassan Habib Mansour, who is the executive director of PRI in Bangladesh, and Dr. Bowman, who might be the next finance minister, he will say. Um, next one is coming out next month. If you are in Dhaka, I invite you to the book launch, as they do this, and they have a picture of the book on your chest. Um, so, and also, I want to make a plug for my. <coughs> organization in Boston. I'm based at Harvard. We have every year two or three conferences on Bangladesh. Um, I put a brochure there, the last one that we organized one, just a month ago. I'm sorry I had to make a point for that. And you might see it on sustainable development. Um, and we have a great bunch of people who all this are fighting for Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you. Please tell me, please, I mean, uh, um, I'm Abdinama, Chief Economist for South Asia Region in the World Bank, based in Delhi and around the world. I'm Bibi Rokia Sahib. Uh, I have my bachelor's degree from Afghanistan, Kabul University. I was CFM participant in 2014 and 2016. I'm Ajita Roy Choudhury. I'm from uh, India. I teach in uh, one of the leading universities in India, Jalapur University, ranked very high now. Uh, it's very, it's a matter of luck that I'm here because uh, I came from something else. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Salim, who is a good friend of mine for quite a uh, number of years now, he just told me that if I could come. And it's good that uh, I'm at least representing part of India because it's surrounded by Bangladesh. <laughs> <laughs> We can have some voice from India too. <laughs> Obviously, complementary to each other. That's it for the time. We are here to support you too. So. <laughs> Please. Um, yeah. Hi, uh, this is Maria. Um, I work here at the World Bank uh, headquarters in the Education GP. I'll be presenting later today on SDG 4, which is, I think, uh, the main focus of uh, my work. Um, I also happen to be a SESAM uh, alumni, and also I'm a Fulbright somewhere, so I'm a Fulbright alumni. So I'm looking forward to connect with uh, all of you uh, if you do it for the Thank you. Please come. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Tanu Kumar. 
uh, this is part of the 10th uh, South Asian Economic Students Meet in Lahore, Pakistan, uh, representing the Indian delegation. Uh, I'm currently a PhD student at Major University, uh, pursuing my PhD in the field of ecological economics, uh, when we consider the economy not isolated to the product biosphere but embedded in it. Thank you. My name is Aaron Walter Schechter. I'm from New York. I'm here to learn about sustainable development in South Asia. I just graduated with a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Economics and Environmental Studies from SUNY Plattsburgh. I look forward to hearing your opinions about sustainable development today. Robert. I'm Robert. I'm at the South Asia Office of the Chief Economist here at the World Bank, and I'm the macroeconomist in the team. Thank you. Uh, you just uh, tell Daisy you could, you could introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Shiva. I graduated with an economics and political science degree from the University of Minnesota, and I'm currently pursuing my master's in public policy from George Washington. Excellent. And uh, you please. Uh, hello, once more, it's Kajas Joy, and I'm uh, from the Chief Economist Office of uh, South Asia. Thank you. Thank you all. I think uh, without much ado, we can start with the first session. May I request uh, uh, to Robert Kerr, uh, Michelle, you can. Michael, here, if I can pronounce it correctly, please come to make the trigger presentation. Dr. Anita Varajari, please, I'm a panelist. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Bozal Khandukar, he couldn't make it. He was supposed to travel from. Uh, OK, uh, sure, you're most welcome. And also, uh, Dr. Bozal Khandukar, he couldn't come because uh, he got uh, sick, uh, just uh, with high fever. Uh, Dr. Kali Maru, please come. Uh, please, if you can, if you want to come and join here. And I will also request Martin to join the session. So let's hear, uh, I think uh, it's better to sit over there to see the presentation. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so uh, one more thing. I think uh, we'll adjust the time accordingly. Uh, we'll eat up a bit of, uh, from the lunch time. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, as you know, the trigger presentation will be for 50 to 20 minutes. And the panelists will get into 10 minutes. Then we'll have at least 30 minutes for the session. That is something very important. Please go. I'll be the timekeeper, so I'll give you a warning from the Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you for the opportunity to open the growth session. It's a great pleasure and honor. What I will focus my talk on is, is the demand to keep focusing on exports in the region. But let's start the growth session with a look at the, at the growth of different regions of the world. And let's take notice that South Asia is now, for some time, the fastest growing region in the world. And according to the World Bank growth projections, South Asia will consolidate its leadership of global growth. What you see here on the slide is the growth of the different regions for different years, and the line on the top is South Asia. And the second fastest growing region in the world is East Asia and Pacific, but as you see, the gap widens over time. Now, this very strong growth projection for the region builds on strong growth of exports. Exports declined in 2015. They grew only a little last year. They're supposed to grow around 6% this year and then to continue growing around 6% for the years they have. Now I will look a little bit into exports and the export sector and some challenges I had. And I will base this presentation and the analysis of this presentation all on the last South Asia Economic Focus, which as Martin mentioned before, is our biannual economic update for the region. And as Martin mentioned as well, there is an effort to increasingly build on the views within the region too. We want to learn from the people based in the region, living there, growing up there, what's going on. And we built, so, so we sent out, out a survey to 200 economists in the region. And we were very, very happy with the response rate, over 20 percent responded, so we have 50 responses to, to, to build upon. And we use the assets to our survey, and I know that some of you really did it, uh, which I'm very grateful for. We used the results in many instances within the report. In my presentation, I just want to show one to motivate a bit the topic of the focus, but also the topic of this talk. We asked 200 economists in the region, what do you expect to happen with US trade policy? 
and only a tiny fraction, around 10%, expect US trade policy to remain unchanged. 45% expect trade policy to become more protectionist selectively, targeting some countries. In this case, we ask them about Mexico and China. But an equal amount, 45% of the respondents, expect more protectionism across the board, including South Asia. And then it was raising the question, should South Asia worry? Should maybe in light of the globalization backlash and changing global trade policies, should South Asia maybe even stop focusing on its as an engine of growth? And I will argue in my talk that this is not the case. And I will build this first argument on three steps. First, one effect we already saw is the stalemate of the mega regional trade agreements, TTIP and TPP. But from a South Asian perspective, that's not bad news. None of the South Asian countries was part of these trade agreements. There's a couple of research done within the region, all based on the GTAP model, showing that South Asia would have had negative impact, would have had been negatively impacted by these agreements. They are not coming, that's not too bad for South Asia. Second, in case US trade policies become more protectionist selectively, there may even be some opportunities for South Asia to gain from trade diversion. So the analysis we did here is built on the World Bank linkage model, which is very, very similar to the GTAP model, one of these models you use to study the effect of different tariffs and trade policies. And the simulation we did is what happens if the US increases the tariffs for imports from China and from Mexico by 10 percentage points. And then obviously, the exports from China and Mexico to the US decline. The US is not producing all that stuff itself, but demand for other countries increases. And we, are, we find in the simulation that the exports from South Asian countries to the US increase between 10 percent for India and 15 percent for Bangladesh. Now the extent to which the increased demand from the US translates into additional exports overall depends very much on how elastic the supply in South Asia reacts to this increased demand. It really depends on whether you just export more to the US but less to other countries, or whether you export more overall. But if supply is a bit elastic, then we do find meaningful effects. It can be anything from 0.5% in India, with inelastic supply to 3% with elastic supply in Bangladesh. So the second point, <coughs> if trade policy is more protection selectively, there may be gains through trade diversion for South Asia. But what if the trade policy becomes more protectionist across the board? In the survey we found that nearly half of the respondents expect more protectionism across the board. So we use the same model and then another scenario, what happens if the US increases the tariffs by five percentage points across the board, including South Asian countries? And what we find is that it, that is of course bad for South Asian countries like all others, so their exports to the US decline. However, the effect is not very big. So independent of the elasticity of domestic supply, the effect for the overall exports will be less than one percent. Building on these three arguments, there possibly is no reason to focus less on these points. Having that established, let me make two more important points. First, except for India, exports in South Asia are not very diverse. What you see here is a breakdown of the export per sector. The more colors you have, the more diversified you are. India looks pretty diversified. Bangladesh is over 90% of the exports are in Texas. Now we were interested in a scenario of trade diversion. What could be the beneficial effect of trade diversion? And that is a question that you cannot easily answer with a GTAP model or the linkage model or similar models because these models use rather broad product categories. So instead we switch to another methodology <coughs> and we use a microeconometric trade model which has been built and estimated by Kia Nikita, and he helped us during this analysis. She's also the board man. 
She's a microeconometric trade model with estimated price elasticities for over 6,000 products. So with this, with the estimations, you exactly know if you increase the tariffs from China to the US by 10 percentage points, the price will increase by 10 percentage points. How much will this affect the imports from the US? So then we do the same analysis as before. We increase, same scenario, increase the tariffs by 10 percentage points. And then the crucial question is, as US imports from, from these countries, China and Mexico fall, who supplies the products? That's a question that, now this model cannot really answer anymore, but we can make different assumptions, test different options, and maybe can see something. So we compare three different options. For all of them, we assume that the total US imports remain unchanged. So the US is now not starting to reduce that stuff, but just import from somewhere else. The first option is the no diversification story. In, in this scenario, South Asian countries are only exporting more to the US in those product categories, down to 6,000 categories, in which they are already exporting. And we compute the amount of additional exports by keeping the market share of all other countries in the And then we have a different option where we allow for some diversification. So the South Asia now is starting to also export new product categories. So if you produce t-shirts made out of cotton, and now you see, and then so far the Chinese make it out of man-made fiber, now the prices of their increase, you're going to go into man-made fiber too. And then the third is strong diversification, where you're really successful in doing this. And what we find is, the effects are rather strong. In the no diversification scenario, there really is only a little effect. And that's also a warning thinking about the GTAP simulation. It's not because there they aggregate product categories, and then they get an elasticity that promises huge gains. What you don't gain if you do not start producing new, exporting new products. And if you have some diversification, you're going to benefit more, and the stronger the diversification will be, the more successful it will be, the more you're going to benefit. And in this specific scenario, of course, it's going to be more successful if your export basket mirrors more than one of China and Mexico. And while this now is a story of increasing tariffs from the US to China, the conclusion remains valid more broadly. <clears throat> the same would be true if you think about making benefit of rising wages in China. Now another thing that the GTEP models are not really good at capturing are growth spillovers. We have growth recovery in advanced countries. The question is how do they go spill over to South Asia? In the GTEP model, if you increase UF growth by one percentage point, there really is a very small effect on other countries. But empirically, we know that the effects are stronger. There has been estimations of growth spillovers from the US to emerging markets, and in general, they're pretty large. So another thing um, I did for the report, and that's still work in progress a bit, but I will show you one first result, is I replicate a methodology by, by Alan Zur and use the BI map, which is a standard structural vector autoregression model in which you have 10 variables, you have an external block and an internal block, and using this methodology, you really can, can estimate the effect of the external factors on, on emerging markets. And we can discuss methodology later, I don't want to bore you with this, um, but what I want to show you is the average response of South Asian countries. So here, this is what happens if you shock US growth or your area growth. How does that affect growth in the South Asian countries? And then I estimated this for four countries, for Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. And then I did a simple average. And I find this a very nice graph because it shows you that if you have higher growth, there are meaningful effects on South Asian countries. And interestingly, in contrast to many other emerging markets, the effects from the US and from the Euro area are rather similar. Which is, of course, because many South Asian countries export a lot to the EU. This result, OK, question? Uh, can we ask what you? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I think I mean, this is a finished presentation, right, so then right. we can be more structured. OK, I mean, I'm basically at the end of my presentation. This last result shows you that the region stands to gain 
from the growth recovery in advanced economies. And one way to benefit from this is, of course, by, by higher export to these countries. That's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> May I request the panelists to come work here? Uh, I must thank Robert. I think this was an excellent presentation, and I also very much look forward to hearing from the very distinguished panelists. But let me just try to structure the discussion, you know, and I would expect the uh, kind of uh, you know, that uh, response from the panelists also. I thought that there are five issues which are going to talk about uh, challenges of growth acceleration and growth maintenance in South Asia. First is that the South Asian country, South Asia, actually the growth experience is not uniform. So you have some countries who are really doing some work, doing well, and some countries are actually lagging behind. So how do you really understand the differences in this growth experience? That's the first point. And what really makes this difference? Actually, there's a very kind of, you know, I, I used to think that whether we have any kind of South Asian growth model compared to the East Asian model. So, you no, know, I, I just put this question. Second one, of course, I think very nicely, uh, Robert talked about this uh, macroeconomic issues and especially looking at the export, but whether there are other macroeconomic challenges uh, you know, in, 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 in when we want to uh, talk about the growth expression, growth maintenance. Third, I think that was also very nicely came out in Robert's presentation, the drivers of growth, especially whether export. Uh, and uh, uh, we know that you know, the very new fiscal framework, of course, the factor accumulation and the factor productivity is a kind of very, very important. And then, the kind of drivers like export, remittance, these have been very two very major drivers in the countries who are doing well, very well. And even some of the countries, even for Nepal, maybe not much is being reflected in the growth, but very much in the poverty allocation, is very remittance is a major factor. But maybe I would really love to hear from first from Nepal, sir, you was here, you were here that you know whether remittance is it a kind of sustainable model for growth. So that is and whether we can look for some new set of drivers for growth in South Asia. Or which are the new set of drivers? I thought that there could be two. Uh, you know, if we can look at those issues, like of course FDI. This region is actually very less FDI recipient. So why we are not really being able to you know, tap on those potential FDI? And second thing, I think that is really Marty's you know, area where he's working on. He's coming up with a new publication on why we are not really being able to utilize the regional integration tool effectively for growth acceleration and growth maintenance. So actually, in one of my work and paper, I really argued that uh, in order to have effective integration, we need growth integration among the South Asian countries. Growth in one country should be a function of growth in other countries, whether we are linked. And we know that which are the factors, value chain, regional value chain, global value chain, you know, these are very important. This is my, so this is my third. Fourth one, uh, I think, when you talk about growth acceleration, like, you know, from one kind of growth path to a higher growth path, and then growth maintenance, like whether we're able to maintain that growth. So I, I thought that there, you know, the factors are maybe different for determining those two. So we may have certain surge in growth rate, but whether you, can, you are able to maintain that growth rate for long, that these are the challenges, whether we can differentiate those factors. And very finally, that's why I'd really love to hear from Dr. Kaji Marko Islam also, when you talk about the deeper determinants of growth, whether we need to go beyond a very conventional understanding of growth, bringing in the institutional issues, both the economic issues, economic institutions, and political institutions, and whole uh, ideas of governance, and these kind of so, you know. So I'd like to hear these uh, this, uh, things as well. So with these, uh, may I request uh, Dr. Ajita Varachidari, if you can please, you know, uh, yes, uh, please, please. Point, so if I can go over there. Yeah, I can help yeah. you because I put that forward.
Actually, I have a, uh, I thank uh, Sanem and Gordon for inviting me here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, without yes. Uh, Actually, Selim has put me in a difficult position because I'm a panelist in the second session also, which is on regional integration. And he himself said that growth and regional integration are related to each So if I open my Pandora's box right now, what shall I say in the next session? So I keep something under the sleeves, although I should have discussed this and uh, discussed something else. Now to me, uh, I am not really uh, very competent to talk about all the regions in South Asia. I have worked on India, so I can speak about India. And India is, a, as you can understand, should be the major driver. Although unfortunately, given the bad regional integration scenario, India is not playing its role. And uh, so the thing is a little different. Let me focus on India. I want to tell you a couple of important things. One is, when we talk about sustainable economic growth, that's very important. And uh, as you know, India did not depend on export so much. They depend, uh, their dependence on domestic market was far more than exports. Although it's picking up lately. But obviously for India, the uh, role of export and the role of export in case of, say, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh is different. So that has to be uh, kept in mind. And the biggest problem which I have, and I will just present it in several tables, sustainability means what? Uh, I'm not going into the ecological dimension. I'm going to the other dimension. Suppose you have a categorization of industries. And India, obviously, manufacturing has grown. But as we know, services have grown more than manufacturing. But as I will come later, half of the services originate in manufacturing. So if we think that the services hang there as a separate entity, we are wrong. Transportation, accounting, finance, after sales, retail, <coughs> everything depends on manufacturing. So if the manufacturing grows, the service sector will be, uh, will be given a boost. Otherwise, independently, if we think about the service sector, maybe 50% of the services originate there. So sustainability really means that if we have a growing industrial sectors in India, for example, whether uh, that gro growth in the industrial sector is sustained so that if we take ranks of industries who are growing fast, the ranks will have a very high rank correlation among each other. Otherwise, you will see that in decades, the ranks are changing very rapidly. If that happens, sustainability is a difficult proposition. One has to really look into why the ranks are changing so frequently. right? And let me go to this. These are the ranks. This is one of my students is working on that. It will be published uh, soon, but not yet. It's ready completely. These are the ranks of industries. And you can see the ranks, as it is, if you look at it, very difficult. They're numbers. But if you go to the rank correlation coefficient, absolutely nothing. Except that the rank in 90 to 99, that day, and the rank in, I have up to 2012, but that hasn't changed much. There is a slight correlation, Spearman's rank correlation coefficient on the negative side, significant. So uh, the growth scenario, the pattern of growth of industries over decades have changed drastically. And you might say, that's logical. Things are changing, the demand is changing, so the composition of industries will change. But such a very you know, weak rank correlation is not good. But that's exactly what has happened in this. Now, uh, if we go a little bit more, I think the biggest problem which we have, and any growth, if we talk in terms of, you know, we also do models. We have models and various kinds of models, scenarios, simulations, etc. But the fact remains, and this is true for many of these South Asian countries, we have a large unorganized sector. Think about Bangladesh, think about Nepal, think about Pakistan, think about India. Huge unorganized sector. And these are the data. It's very difficult to get exact data. But these data were compiled by, uh, there's a commission which was set up in India, National Commission for uh, Unorganized Sector. They published this data. And these are old data, 99, 2000. But I don't think it has changed much. There is a lot of stability in this kind of data. Now, given this, if you have growth with unorganized sector not in mind, 
It contributes almost 45% to our GDP and 90% to employment. So growth as such without delving into this scenario will create all sorts of problems. And if India is unstable, the whole South Asia region will be unstable. We have to remember that. And given this, again, uh, these data, and this is an index which I borrowed from an article which came out uh, in the ADB and World Scientific. F index is the index of fragmentation. As you know, the Marshallian world of theory of firm is gone. <clears throat> now the theory is fragmentation. It's a fragmented world. The production is fragmented. Since there is a lot of development in the service sector, the whole fragmentation has gone in different stages. And so that giant farm concept is gone. And this is the fragmentation index which shows which industry has more scope for fragmentation. And surprisingly, the L by K ratio, if you look at it, that L by K which they have calculated with this article, which is ADB stuff, was calculated this, you will find surprising things. We think that some of this labor intensive industry is the direct input. But if you take the whole input output analysis, of the national, international dimensions all taken together, services included, then things are different. Some of these industries, for example, metal products, have a lot higher L by K ratio than, say, industries like textile or maybe timber or pulp. So some of the labor intensive in the food or whatever. I'll finish it. I'm almost done. So why I'm taking the F index? Because this will come again in my regional integration scenario. That's true. Because now if you think about growth with the Marshallian farming concept, then we are nowhere. If we take the fragmented world, that concept, and then link the trade theory, not in the hexagon only, <coughs> the fragmented world, then we are somewhere in real. Most of our models are still in hexagon only framework. <coughs> and the export led growth is still in that framework. And we are nowhere really <coughs> unless we bring in this uh, fragmentation story in the model. Now, what I did, these are very quickly, labor productivity growth, again, uh, TFPG growth, and I have got, again, a rank correlation analysis. That those industries which have a very rapid growth in TFPG, those industries which have got very high fragmentation index, are, are these industries related to each other in terms of rank? Or those industries which have got high unorganized sector, are they linked to the export scenario or something like that? Very bad rank correlation. No significance. Insignificant. They are moving in their own dimensions. That's not good for a growth scenario. And India being the biggest partner is disturbing. Job is the biggest problem in our country. And if growth is not linked to jobs, we are in trouble. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ranchanhuri. I think that was an excellent presentation. Actually, uh, I thought that there are three major points we covered. Of course, how do you really deal with the services sectors and how the service sector is linked with the rest of the economy, especially the manufacturing. And you rightly pointed out if we take out manufacturing, probably 50% of the services sectors will not have much base. So, how do you really understand uh, in the context of growth? Secondly, we talked about the informality. I think it's very important. The unorganized sector, as you define in the context of India, in terms of growth and employment, how the policies framework or the policy issues affect informal sector, that is something very important. And thirdly, we talked about the fragmentation and how these are also linked to the value chain. It's a very, very good. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. May I invite uh, uh, Dr. Martin Rama? Uh, please. Thank you. Um, uh, like Dr. Rajiv, I prefer to leave uh, anything related to regional integration to the next session. You know, that, uh, we on the growth part. And I would like to, uh, to make a, a few comments. And in fact, uh, I want to start from, uh, I'm returning now from a week in China, where we meeting uh, leading policy think tanks at the city level in Shanghai and Beijing, and also at the national level. And also the contrast with South Asia uh, is very interesting. These are two very rapidly growing regions in the world. Uh, and uh, there is a similarity when you look at growth rates. And yet, what is underlying the growth process is very different. Uh, in, 
I was also for many years based in Vietnam and I see similarities with, uh, with China. When you look at this data, there is a very strong strategic drive a clarity on what is being done and then an implementation that follows. Uh, and it's quite remarkable how a consensus is built on decisions that are pretty big, uh, that in other circumstances, in other contexts, could take a lot of time to, uh, to really reach a consensus and move. And here you see them uh, charging ahead anything from uh, the development of, uh, of Shanghai and Pudong to the way now uh, Beijing is addressing environmental uh, concerns to the uh, growth strategy in the, the new sectors. Uh, South Asia is not like that. And I want to, to emphasize that and in part relate also to, to my opening speech is that the political economy is much more complex in South Asia and that has implications for the growth path and, and the way uh, reforms are conducted. Uh, in, in a way, while you can trace big that we form uh, points in East Asia, uh, it's more difficult to find something similar in uh, Saudi Arabia, with the exception in the case of India, 1991, the, the abolition of the Raj. And, and even that, if you take uh, people like uh, Danny Roderick or Arvind Subramanian, they will argue that you don't see much of a change in the growth rate at that point. There was a, an acceleration that was happening anyway. And it continued, it was reinforced, but it's not like a before and after. It is not a then shopping in, in, in China. And so the way South Asia has been growing, uh, growing fast, is a way where reform happens at the margin and in a very sometimes unplanned ways, uh, where there is a path of less resistance. If you look at the success stories uh, uh, in, in, in the region, think of garments in Bangladesh. Many of you are from. The trick there was basically two clever reforms that allowed to bypass the concerns that uh, the regulatory framework was bringing. One was bonded warehouses, so that you could bring the inputs uh, without having to pay customs and duties and get them out. It was like an engineering solution uh, to replace what should have been a uh, trade reform that would allow you to, to bring the inputs. The other was back-to-back -back letters of credit, it was a way to address a financial uh, sector constraint. It was done, it worked very well. It worked in the area of cotton-based companies. There was nothing similar on synthetic fibers, and so Bangladesh is a powerhouse of exports of garments in the cotton sector, and it may be not existed in the ready-made garments. So it's a kind of reform at the margin, and always with a lot of complexity. We are very pleased to see India finally passing the goods and services tax, which is a move towards modern VAT. But the complexity of the process, where uh, four rates, four slabs, plus a zero rate, and uh, all of the discussion has been basically trying to minimize the change, to minimize the change in the revenue that the different states will have, because if there were changes, the political equilibrium would be uh, difficult to handle. So we see. Uh, that makes a, a, a difference in the sense that by addressing reforms at the margin, what we see is uh, breakthroughs, but uh, for instance, in sectors that where you don't have big vested interests. If you look at what happened in India with the IT industry, it was basically something new where there was not a regulatory framework. Basically, the, uh, the entrepreneurs there could catch the regulator by surprise. And so this idea that I think applies to the whole region of India grows by night, uh, which is so different from what you see in East Asia, where you see a strategy and something that, that is implemented. Now, what are, the, what are the, the, the implications of this for the growth of uh, South Asia? I think that there are several implications of this for you. One is that uh, probably it would be more difficult for South Asia to reach really the very, very fast growth that we saw in the case of China. Uh, whether South Asia will get to double digit growth for a relatively extended period of time, uh, I will see it more challenging uh, than, uh, than in the case of uh, Second, it, uh, it involves uh, thinking more creatively. If you have these political economic constraints, we are not good as economists when it comes to political economy. We have nice 
game theory model and all that. Political economy is more complex. Huh? But just thinking, what are the innovations that will allow, like, like uh, as was the case in garments in Bangladesh, that will allow with just the stroke of the pen on a clever two places, all of a sudden, unleash something very big. Uh, and we see it happening. When these things, uh, when, when there is a space, it happens. Look at the low cost, uh, low cost aviation in, in India, for instance, or low airports. It, it has been a phenomenal transformation. But it happens, you have to be finding at the area. When I think about cities and, and the contrast with uh, the rise of, of East Asian cities, where you, you need really to bring together the investments in sanitation, transportation, uh, zoning, and all that together. And that in South Asia it's so difficult. South Asian cities do not have empowered mayors. In some cases, they don't even have mayors. So they have multiple mayors for the same city as in the case of Dhaka. So it's very difficult to have these. And, and where, what is innovation we see in South Asia, one that we are starting to study now, we see private cities, which is something that nobody had thought about. Although there are a few examples here. If you have come from Dallas Airport, you might have seen Preston. Preston is a private city. So there are. These places where someone has enough land to have a vested interest in maximizing their agglomeration effect. And so you have, you go to seminars in South Asia and you find these investors say, oh, we don't have a lot of money. Well, we only have $5 billion. But if we get close to an airport or close to a highway, we can get to, you have the Gurgaons and, and places like that that are emerging. So uh, there is something very creative uh, that is happening. But it's happening in these ways that are at, at the margin and very different from what we see in East Asia. So the first implications from that is it will be it will be interesting and, and we will learn a lot. I think uh, uh, things that are to me are really innovations on a big scale. What will happen with these private cities? You are getting of Bashundar in the case of, uh, of those of you from from Bangladesh. The positives and the negatives of, of that, uh, where at some point you have almost a separate governance in, in some parts of uh, of your country, um, but. Uh, is a region that has so much entrepreneurship that maybe uh, there is a prospect of sustaining growth for, for, for some time there. Where I see the, 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 the perhaps a bigger risk, so the, the first risk is you may not get to the double digit growth that you would like to do. So the second risk is that um, when you create these spaces on the margins, you have very dynamic entrepreneurs in, in, in South Asia, with a region of phenomenal entrepreneurship that can get the private sector going. But you don't have the equivalent for public goods. There is no entrepreneurship for the public goods at equity, environmental sustainability, where this approach of letting things happen by night will get to them. So I see that as the <coughs> other drawback uh, for the region, and, and, and I think we will have to be um, willing to pay attention to this. Uh, and last point is uh, uh, difference like cross uh, uh, through the region. Uh, South Asia is a very special region in the sense that uh, India is disproportionately big in relation to the region compared to any other of the regions we did. China in East Asia is smaller than India in South Asia. You know? So a lot of what happens in, in South Asia when we look at the bigger figures is a story that is uh, very much driven by India. But what I would say is that overall, if you take the eastern part of the region, uh, if you take Bangladesh, India, uh, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, you see a path that is of sustained growth. Uh, phase. Um, it's more confusing in the case of Nepal. That in Nepal, the growth rate of GDP is not too high. Uh, I would say it's remarkably high for a country emerging from a civil war. So I would say Nepal has done much better than many people could have on this page. Now, if you take the income, not the product, uh, then Nepal has been growing very rapidly, basically because they have been placing people uh, abroad. And, and, and one can see it under a negative lens in, in, in many ways, but it has many positives. There is skills acquisition, there is sending of uh, flow back. I would say from a gender perspective, it has done wonders. Sending men out is a great thing for gender empowerment. You can tell you for gender empowerment. Uh, where I see it more complicated is on the uh, western part. Uh, Afghanistan, especially, and Pakistan are in slow growth. Uh, Afghanistan, very slow growth. Pakistan, gradually improving, but still at a relatively low level when you take into account population growth. And on a per capita basis, 
Pakistan is about half of the per capita basis of what is happening in the eastern part. And I think there, there are a few other things that are mapping, in particular security concerns. Uh, you will see uh, reflected in the investment rate. Well, you have investment rates of 30% of GDP in the eastern part of the region. You have investment rates of 15% or less of GDP in the western part. So that would be my third concern. Again, first concern, may be difficult to get to double digit rates. Second concern, very important, is this constrained way of reforming will not be good for public goods, equity, environmental sustainability. Third concern, we may have a region that is going at two speeds, and that's not very good. Thank you, Martin. You also talked about, uh, in addition to what you summarized at the, <coughs> at the end, uh, you talked about very nicely about the institutions and the political perspective, especially in the example of um, Bangladesh and also India, a very, some kind of very unconventional or uh, not very uh, formal kind of rules-based institutional arrangement rather than in many cases actually <coughs> some, I think I draw from my some very recent work with Vlad Richard, uh, this more on the deals-based kind of system, where, you know, it's not very, you can't say that actually what happened for ready-made government sector in Bangladesh, whether you can replicate the same thing for other sectors in Bangladesh. That's a big challenge. Also, probably the same case in India, where what you have done for IT sector, whether you can do the same thing for other sectors. Uh, whether what really makes a difference, so I think that's fantastic. You brought this point very nicely. Uh, may I request Dr. Kali Maruprisnam then to share some light on these political issues? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be here to be invited in this uh, uh, very important discussion forum. Uh, and uh, let me start with thanking you, uh, thank you to, uh, Dr. Robert and uh, Professor Alita Braishoguri and also uh, Martin. Uh, in fact, uh, Robert and Alita, uh, what they have said that like they use uh, kind of economic data. And uh, from one, uh, and Robert has explained the situation from international perspective, but uh, Professor Chennai Shoguri has focus on India case, and Martin has given us a more or less regional uh, common uh, focus on the uh, road issue. Uh, mine will be more uh, focused on the domestic one. Like, uh, the assumption is that like this international trade, exports, and the regional integration will work if the if certain conditions of the domestic one remain sanctioned. So my my uh, comments uh, will be uh, uh, sort of like effort to unpack the what are the domestic conditions that can uh, help uh, that can help to sustain uh, the growth. I feel like the uh, uh, development uh, is a kind of a transformation which includes uh, economic politics and society. And this transformation uh, is, is not a linear. I and mean, we, we all know and appreciate that it's a very uh, complex and uh, also uh, non-linear phase. And it has kind of a, uh, it follows sort of episodes like growth trajectory for any country. I mean, uh, it, it just don't, uh, uh, the, follow a very coherent sequence. It has episodes, so it has ups and downs in the country and also in the region. So uh, having said that, uh, we can uh, identify the three major episodes like the growth acceleration phase, the growth stagnation phase, and growth collapse phase. Uh, we, I mean, in the region and in other parts of the world, we experience that sort of phases in the in, in growth regime. And uh, well, I, I'll be I'll be talking more on Bangladesh experience, uh, not in the region or other part. So, if it, uh, and however, like the theories and uh, our experiences of other countries shows that, uh, I mean, without referring to any particular uh, literature, I mean, it's a kind of a summary of the relevant literature. We see that there are uh, conditions like a leadership with a long-term vision is uh, one of the conditions that, we, uh, that is important uh, for, for the growth regime to sustain. And, uh, and yes, uh, and also a political system that can channel uh, the voices of various interest groups, which includes like workers, peasants, and particularly the middle class, uh, the growing middle class. 
And the third point is like institutions that can protect basic rights, especially the property rights. And, and the fourth condition is that a civil society, main, and which is mainly composed of this, this middle class, and, and which, are, which is supported by a reasonable, uh, reasonably functional media or uh, freedom of expression. So if these four conditions exist, then you can expect that, uh, 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 and if the other global and international uh, situation remains some change, then you can expect a kind of a, a sustenance of the growth regime. If we look at uh, uh, Bangladesh case in particular, uh, what, what we see is that it's like, still you can see that it is in a kind of a, at a, an acceleration phase, and it's growing. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's a little bit slower than what you can expect, or, or what in compared to other other neighbors and in the in this eastern, uh, southeast Asian region. It's growing, but still, it's it's not growing at the at the rate what you can expect. Uh, so, still, it is in that acceleration phase. However, uh, I mean, if, if you if you look at the conditions, the domestic conditions, you see a kind of a paradoxical situation. What is that like? First, the leadership thing, the first condition. You see the leadership what we have at the moment, and the political leadership uh, is uh, in, in many ways, you, you can say that if this leadership has a long-term vision. We have a vision 2021, and the, the, the current regime, they offer the vision 2021, which is the first time in the history that they the political uh, uh, ruling elites, they're talking about long-term vision. And, and uh, even then, they introduced a uh, perspective plan, which also uh, includes another 20 years or so, like 2050. So which means the political elites, this, and even even if you if you look at other other contesting political groups, like the, the large opposition party in the country, they're also now offering a vision 2030. So, uh, you see, the political leadership is now coming to uh, coming up with some long-term vision. So, uh, which is which is a good condition for growth to sustain. However, the political system, like I, I political system, in, it's a kind of a broad term which includes the polity. Uh, it's you see, it's a kind of a, uh, it's a different situation. What like the majority, like the political system, uh, moving from a kind of a a reasonable degree of competition to a closed system. So, closed system in the sense that the election, I mean, the, the main, main uh, one of the main main institutions of this, this political system, the election, election is, in, is, is, is kind of a question. I mean, it is, it is moving from a participatory election to a, a less participatory election. And uh, uh, competition has been very low in the last election, and uh, uh, and, and other material condition, uh, conditions have not really uh, changed that much, which which can tell us that the upcoming election will be competitive or fair. And then another thing is that the monopolization of local political space by the ruling parties, meaning a uh, government has introduced a new 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 law that allows uh, the local elections to be held by the party. A monogram, party, party level. So, which means the political I and mean, the partisan movement. The, so it has it has gone down all the way to, to the local level. So the political divide has has spread from the national level to the to the uh, community level. So uh, that means this uh, since we do not have like uh, we do not have uh, enough institutional checks. And that can ensure fair election. So this sort of uh, partisan divide all the way down to the grassroots, it basically can create exclusion of the other small groups. So the political system uh, in that way is moving from more kind of a uh, closed system. And for the institutions, like, uh, well, if we take uh, uh, the idea of uh, limited access order, I guess uh, it, it can explain the situation. And uh, uh, in fact, it's a monopoly over economic opportunities. Uh, for example, like big, big business deal, like big, big government procurement, like jobs, small trades, that have been captured by the uh, by the by the ruling party and the party cadres. So, 
uh, which means, and also like as I say, like local government, local political space has been uh, has been uh, context uh, uh, and under pressure with the executive branch. That means, uh, and you don't have enough uh, protection from from the judiciary. So uh, that means the property rights and the basic rights. Uh, it's under under kind of a challenge, and this shows a sort of a fragile uh, institutional regime, which which could pose a, a big threat for the uh, for the for the growth regime, and uh, and the civil society, civil society, uh, you know, like it has two roles. Like in the first 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 place, it does provide sort of legitimacy uh, to the ruling ruling elites, and also it can play a role of Negotiation between between the masses and the elites. So, for for the for, for the growth to sustain, you need a vibrant civil society group, and uh, which is uh, which is under pressure now because uh, of this the law, the ICT Act, uh, and which is uh, we, uh, and particularly it has a, a, an article, Article 57, that curbs uh, the freedom of expression to a large extent. Uh, so it. And uh, these are also kind of a repressive. There are other repressive laws, uh, and uh, uh, particularly the, uh, I mean, uh, the local administration, particularly police, government, other state agencies, they are playing a kind of a repressive role for the civil society. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it has a kind of a negative impact. It may have a negative impact on the growth. Yeah, I'm almost done. So, uh, yeah, I mean, these conditions. Uh, well, it, uh, and they haven't developed to a fuller extent, um, but the symptoms are very much there. So if we don't address them, then uh, I'm not sure if this, uh, that the pace of acceleration of growth, how long it will continue. Uh, so uh, uh, I mean, uh, we, we have to acknowledge that if we don't really address this political situation, this institution con conditions, then um, we we are in big, we might be in big, big trouble. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, here, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, some very interesting points, especially related to uh, the political economic institution issues and the growth. And probably you did not utter that word, but the democracy is needed uh, for the growth. But probably we can uh, discuss this. And also, you very much, uh, very nicely brought out the issues of uh, uh, the limited access order, or even the theories by Mushtaq uh, Khan on the political settlement and kind of challenges. Uh, and then, uh, the, whether uh, the very new institutional economics, whether talk about very well defined uh, property rights uh, for a well defined rules based system, like Asimov and Robinson, they are, whether they are very much consistent with uh, South Asian economics. So thank you so much. With this, I, I'd like to open the floor. And uh, I will, of course, start with uh, Mokhtar, because he has got his breath for a long days, Mokhtar. And then please, uh, you can be brief, and then I will get to that. Uh, my question is to Robert. Um, it's a very, I think it's uh, on your methodology, when you were talking about the growth group speed over. So I was just wondering, what are the, like, uh, Factors you considered in your model was it like fully driven by the trade between US and the other countries, or we're also thinking about some API or any kind of overseas uh, assistance going on? So what are the factors? I was wondering that because you you found a positive result, and also like whether there is a very strong like variance among the benefits this South Asian countries are getting. Okay. So the first is. Um, the way the, the VAR is set up at the moment, you do control the financing conditions for emerging markets. You control that if the US grows faster, the interest rates they arise, and that often has repercussions to, to the emerging markets. So you have like 10 variables in the VAR, and some of them control for the global conditions, and some control for the, for the country conditions. And if, if you believe the identification scheme, then what you capture is really a surprising additional growth in the US and the UA area to the growth in South Asia. The Southern countries that have. So the because you think you identify growth spillovers, it's probably going to exports. So 
So what I'm working on right now is decomposing the GP, the moment of GP, the model. I want to decompose this into exports and the other components, and then really show that, that it exports as a channel in the, this below. The diversity in the South Asian countries um, is large, and that's partly why I showed you the average, because it looks so much better. Uh, but this is also why it's still a work in progress, and I'm working on it um, to figure out um, what it is, and it's not that easy to estimate for the region. So for India, you have reasonably good data, and you have a beautiful response. Um, you need to do some approximations of for each people by a dish. It's a little bit more difficult. Um, so, so this work in progress, but um, I hope I will have a nice response for all the countries. Excellent. So please, next set of questions, comments. Uh, yes, please. I'm sorry, Salim, I would defer to anybody else if they have a question, because I think this conference is a great opportunity for students who are just coming up to speed in terms of economics to ask this distinguished panelist. So <clears throat> I might, I'll just ask one question and one comment, and I'm hoping that I don't take too much of Time, good time. Uh, with regard to the last uh, panelist, uh, I understand Bangladesh doesn't have democracy 100%, but do we need democracy for growth, sustainable growth? And the reason I say that I travel to Washington with Bangladeshi ambassador to a Western European country. I was supposed to fly, but he came along. I said, come on, let's go there. And he is skeptical about democracy. But one thing he did say, if this government or this political party stays for another 10 years, I think we'll do well in terms of SDG. And I was surprised, because it's not the ruling party type of guy. He's actually government. So that's a question. And you see the result or the kind of uh, situation in the USA. I'm not a Republican, but for growth in this country, we need a strong man like him. And I won't name the name person. So that's a question. Now, for the uh, key, uh, keynote presentation, I was intrigued by one of your curve, the last curve, which had elasticity, and I think the growth in development, growth in GDP, or is the growth in export. And would you please give us, because many of us are here also in bond policy, what does that mean for policy for these countries? Thank you. Thank you, what would you like to quickly respond to the last question? So if I um, have reached the goal that we're discussing, how to foster exports, then I already reached one of my main goals, namely let's let's agree on that being very important. And another point I made is, so I don't know whether you are specifically talking about the last of growth spillovers. No, there's a curve. The where growth spillovers. It's, it's the result from a model, and one of the things I was hoping would give us, okay, what is it telling us? What is telling the policymakers? Okay. Should we go for growth? in export, or should they go yeah, for so, diversification? Yeah, so I, thank you for the question. That's um, important to follow up. So what I did, I, I replicated kind of a study that has been done for many other countries for South Asia. So I only have these four countries. From this, it's hard to make more general statements, but relying on the estimations of such people's response functions for 25 other emerging markets, and then looking at characteristics, who are the countries who benefit from higher growth in advanced countries, it's, of course, those who are more open to trade. So when you are at the high export share, then you're going to have to benefit more. That also means that in the case of South Asia, probably, if the US is going to cost the Bangladesh going to have to benefit more than the country that is exporting less to these two countries. So I, I wanted to use the last month's responses to show that even if trade policies may become more protectionist, so there could be bad, bad effects, the growth is so, the growth in advanced economies is recovering, growing strong, 
and they're going to be increased export demand from these countries from which you can benefit. Okay. So, one of the things this report does, in a way, is to get a sense of the magnitude of price effects and income effects. I think with the concern about rising protectionists, we are thinking very much about price effects, yeah, tariffs or non-tariff measures that uh, really make it uh, more costly to import from the region. At the same time, we are seeing an acceleration of growth in uh, both uh, and US. Uh, and what these results suggest in this analysis is that these income effects are quite strong uh, and can be more important even if the price effects, the uh, negative price effects were to materialize, which is not clear, uh, that, uh, that the income effect is very important. Why is it very important? Because paper is how they and exported to both Europe and the US. And that makes a very big difference with the state. Economies are much more integrated through China and the value chain to China. So you have, if you are in East Asia, you are selling to a region that is growing very well but decelerating. If you are in South Asia, you are selling to a world that is growing much less but accelerating. And I think that's the point to uh, not to lose focus on, on, on the exports. What we hear is a lot of pessimism of saying, okay, we have large domestic markets, forget about exports. And we know that there are many spillovers that go beyond the spillovers that you capture in a vast model of the stack in terms of learning, uh, in terms of standards that are associated with it. So that was the point of both strength. Yeah, I think everybody said yes. Please, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, well, it's a very uh, open question. And the answer is yes and no, like with the democracy. Uh, is needed for sustainable growth. Uh, all I want to say uh, is that, like, for the acceleration phase, perhaps uh, I mean uh, <coughs> different histories and trajectories of different countries uh, shows not the difference between democracy and autocracy. So, however, to sustain growth, to sustain, uh, if you see the political stability is is an important value that needs to be there in place. And if you have a population, I mean, if you have a growth without job, and there is a huge number of growing youth population, and uh, uh, if, if the civil society cannot provide the legitimacy to the ruling elites, meaning like the policy regimes, and also uh, the, if, if, if there is uh, um, kind of no check on the capture of economic opportunities by the party cadre, then there, there might be a, a high likelihood to have a a uh, uh, huge political instability, particularly if you look at the history of Bangladesh, then we have phases of political uprise uh, movement. So that can pose a, a big threat to the uh, to this growth regime. So uh, you have to have some institutions in place to ventilate, to voice this uh, uh, these, these groups, and also kind of a, at least, uh, if not very fair, but to reasonable degree of competition for the economic opportunities. If it is not in place, then uh, yeah, then, then, then the growth trading will be in danger, perhaps. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Just to add one thing, what uh, uh, Maruf was just, uh, mentioning, uh, one of the uh, recent work with, uh, of mine with the uh, Manchester University School, uh, uh, Dr. Kumal Sen, uh, and the, uh, the Indian uh, economist, uh, Sobhashan Jukal, actually, we did a large quantity study looking at 125 countries, their growth phases over the last 60 years, try to understand uh, transition over the growth. And using a kind of multinomial logic model, try to understand what institutional factors affect the growth phases, transition from one phase to another phase. So that the interesting finding was that democracy, uh, or the uh, political institutions of democracy, uh, it really matters uh, countries preventing from growth columns. Uh, but it doesn't really matter much when it comes to the country is actually in the acceleration phase. So when you really want to go for a rapid uh, acceleration or rapid growth, maybe the institutions of the democracy didn't matter much, but more of the economic institutions which matter. Anyway, so please, uh, any other question or comments? Please. Thanks. Um, on this uh, topic of growth and also to pick up on a point that uh, Dr. Rama mentioned, 
mentioned earlier on, on the risk of having the South Asia region with two speeds when it comes to growth. Uh, I moved recently from Europe and Central Asia where I spent uh, many years in the country. And uh, probably most of you know that in, uh, in the European Union, uh, for the past couple of years, there was a big debate about this two-speed euro. Um, and in that case, it didn't really uh, focus only on growth. So I wonder if we should look a bit wider, you know, considering other aspects, regional integration, beyond growth, um, uh, governance, uh, immigration, a lot of other aspects that are relevant to both regions. And while I agree that, you know, the two regions are not easily comparable, uh, but I think there are lessons to be shared. And I wonder, you know, what, what's your take on what lessons could be learned, for example, from Europe that are, could be relevant to South Asia? Um, I think uh, that your question uh, on, on Europe and South Asia raises issues of regional integration that uh, I think will be uh, addressed more in the, in the next session. Um, but I think uh, understanding why we are seeing a two-speed uh, South Asia in terms of growth is, is important. And uh, it may not be necessarily related to institutions. There was a time when Pakistan, for a long time, was growing faster than India. Uh, so I, I don't think it's the, the, the fundamental institutions. But my sense is that the political economy and the, the blockages that have been created uh, are, are quite important. I guess the challenge will be to see whether, um, in particular with the China-Pakistan economic corridor, whether Pakistan is able to regain uh, more than uh, the kind of openness that you don't get through policy, the kind of openness that we are not getting through tariff reform, that you have all these uh, mechanisms to really protect incumbents and, and are affecting undermining the other competitiveness of, of Pakistan, whether an economic corridor would be a decent substitute for a policy uh, change in the sense of bringing competition and, 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 and bringing this kind of movement. I think that. But at present, I see that as the main uh, possibility for change uh, in speed in, in, uh, in Pakistan. Um, it's more complex in the case of Afghanistan. Afghanistan has a turbulent history. It had a remarkable period of growth, but under very exceptional circumstances. It was a country that was uh, getting the security uh, with help from abroad and was getting roughly 43% of GDP in flows coming in and wet. Of course, you can get a lot of growth, but it's not sustainable uh, for a long period of time. So I think I think there is more uncertainty in the case of that. Thank you. I would like to just uh, raise a few things. I think uh, based on the discussion we have so far, uh, especially the countries in South Asia, they have different experiences as well as they are facing different challenges as well. For example, uh, uh, though the title of this session is Growth Acceleration, Growth Maintenance, we are not actually talking about the quality of growth. This is also very important. Uh, especially India, probably, uh, Professor Rajivari, he can talk a bit on the kind of jobless growth phenomenon, the, the, which is being very, uh, the alarm has been raised. Also in recent time in Bangladesh as well, very recent data of labor force survey shows that. Though the country is actually growing over 7% you know, in the last, in the last few years, uh, but the, it's not really creating that much of employment. So that is a big question. Also for Sri Lanka, I think one uh, of the biggest challenges is that uh, you know, foreign indebtedness, like you know, the money they are taking from China for infrastructure development, and how they would repay those money back. For Pakistan as well, one of the biggest challenges for the China-Pakistan economy corridor, huge pressure of the balance of payment. How do we really you know, encounter these challenges? So is it something, the number we look at, whether the country is growing at 6 or 7 percent, or we also ask questions whether these, uh, these numbers really make some sense in terms of uh, employment creation and in terms of uh, job creation and population. Maybe these things we can actually carry on our discussion in the next session among the SDGs and also the demographic dividend. But I thought that well, maybe if you, you know, some of you can actually respond to these things more briefly. 
So uh, anyone interested in saying something more? Uh, Ravi, do you have anything from Sri Lanka? Or you play yourself non-partisan, no, <laughs> some like World Bank, you know, it's a global person. <laughs> uh, you can can use your microphone. <laughs> I guess uh, from a Sri Lankan perspective, I think uh, my vision for Sri Lanka, I think it has been a transformational story. And uh, the way I see it is uh, finding their niche in the region. And so, you know, uh, trying to be sort of a Hong Kong uh, for the region. And so, for those kinds of things, I think uh, they have to make the necessary investments. So not only sort of internal infrastructure and stuff, but you know, if they're going to be like this hub, then uh, logistics hub, then we have to make investments in sort of security consistent trade facilitation. So I might not recommend it to every single country in South Asia, but if this is the sort of scenario that you're going in, then these kinds of investments have to be made. If you don't, then you get things that would actually derail the whole strategy, because then you'll get lots of drugs coming in, and it'll have social implications, and people will think this is a bad strategy, right? But so if you want to do it, then you're still going to need much more money to also, you know, actually keep going on the investments instead of, you know, putting capital investments to zero and being fiscally responsible. Uh, but you know, uh, with that where the growth. Thank you. Can I just yes, please, you? please. Sure. Uh, and you have also portion on the jobless growth. That's your question. Yes. Which I, I might answer in the next session more. Mm -hmm. These are the European thing which you mentioned. It's very important in a way. You know, this whole concept of integration and uh, the growth through integration. This came from European Union. And all these textbook stories of customs union, the different stages, all were borrowed from what European Union did. But uh, the lessons now, which we want to follow, is not European Union, but ASEAN. And Europe is also learning from ASEAN. We learn from Russian story, uh, as you know, in our old planned economy, which we in India had for a long time. But now, uh, practically, we are not learning much from the European story. Maybe we learn more how to disintegrate the customs union. That lesson should be important for us, maybe in future. But how they integrated and how the growth took place, this is not much of a discussion now in our region, as far as I understand. And on the jobless growth, very quickly, uh, that's exactly what I pointed out, the quality. I mean, 90% of employment, I think in Bangladesh this is true, in Nepal this is true, in India this is true. 90% is unorganized. And unorganized is a catch-all term. Unorganized in terms of labor market, unorganized in terms of product market. They are two different ball games. Labor market unorganized means you don't have any contracts, you don't have any retirement benefits. That's how the labor works there, most of them. We do not go by the recent work definition of World Bank and others. Whether obviously we like it, but the story in South Asia is something different. And the product market informality is also there. I mean, that's the biggest challenge which uh, Martin mentioned, the GST. Some of these states, which are heavily burdened by this unorganized sector, are very skeptical about that, that the buck will stop somewhere. After all, it's a chain. The, the GST is a chain. And if the buck stops somewhere, because you have more gains in not revealing things than revealing, that happens in case of that also. And when you are moving to GST, this will appear also. Uh, obviously, this will be more attractive to come out of the unorganized uh, uh, nature of product market to organized nature. But there are serious works done, and uh, in fact, I should not say serious work. The serious questions were raised. Less serious work is done on that, but that is needed. So the GST is something which India is pursuing. No other South Asian country has gone into that. So that's an important lesson for the whole of South Asia. What will happen to this? Because it's a chain story. GST will only succeed if the unorganized sector actually turns in product market to more formalized in nature. Otherwise, things have to be careful.
very rightly pointed out, actually, uh, we are having Bangladesh is having the same problem implementing the new VAT law. Yeah. Like you know, because of the huge unorganized sector or informal sector, how do you really can implement it? Because you need the absence of proper tax infrastructure, what I mentioned that, with a you know, proper accounting system. So that's a big challenge, of course, and that has a big implication for the further growth acceleration. Can we hear anything uh, on Pakistan, Maria? Would you like to say a few words? Uh, you know, this is a very gloomy picture for Pakistan growth, or you know, what do you think? That actually no, because Martin was referring to something very important. Pakistan was once marked as a very high growth performing country, and also you know, being as a kind of model country. But then, what happened in the next, you know, in recent time? despite the fact that we compare to other solutions, it's not very low. But he was saying that post-war situation and the post-crisis is not that bad. What do you think? Uh, if you should be welcome all the way from crisis to disaster, in 2016, we had a very low growth rate, almost 0.8%. Then in 2017, ADB estimated that we would have a growth rate of 5.2 to 6.7. So I think it's really something good to talk about. And of course, this year we may have the growth rate that's even the highest growth rate for the Nepal, maybe 705. That has to be uh, estimated by the economic as well. And I would like to highlight some of the facts, uh, so we can talk about the vibration in Nepal and the informal economy, that's uh, informal labor market. I agree that we are still talking, is the migration sunrise or sunset for Nepal in the long run? If we go to, the, if you look at the short term, short term so migration has a very good um, implication in the economy, right? Uh, in, they have very good investment in education, the standard of the people, reduction in poverty, even the health sector. Um, but when it comes to long run, the remittance that come from migrants has been invested more on the luxury things and the living standard only, but there is no job creation activities uh, done from the migration thing. And uh, recently, we have been we have noticing like Nepal has considered as a country that you know, supply labor to the Gulf country and even sometimes to Europe and Australia. 
when you come to the informal labor market, the informal labor market, the biggest um, labor consuming sectors like construction sector and some garment sector has been lacking the labor in Nepal and they have been um, they have been hiring the labor from India and Bangladesh. So we still have to look more over how, what is the factor. We have been sending labor in the construction sector in Gulf country, and we have been lacking the same labor in, in Nepal. So labor gap is also another biggest issues in Nepal. And the uh, informal economy, especially the Hundi, uh, migrants sending the money from Hundi, and people, the very complicated, complicated uh, government policies, uh, to send money from Nepal to the, uh, what do you call, call it, I lost my uh, the business, uh, the country we are doing business like China, the Bangladesh, India, Nepal have a very complicated policy to send money from there. Uh, so it has been another issues to the business person as well. So informal sector has been increasing because of the complicated uh, financial policies as well. Excellent point. I think. Uh, uh, Robert, when you extend your analysis, I think that's something very important because one of the major drivers in South Asia is how this is migration. How they are, you know, because we focused largely on the export, which is very important to testify. Uh, but remittance one and the kind of uh, the recent challenges, because falling remittance, Bangladesh is a, you know, is just simply uh, almost one fifth of the growth, you know, remittance actually, the growth rate has fallen. It's fallen. Similarly, probably for Nepal, is emerging challenges. Afghanistan, okay, I think you can, yes. please, yeah, yeah, sure. or, or just I say something as this. Yeah. Um, okay, so when it comes to Afghanistan, of course, there are many problems. Um, data, there must be data won't be available uh, to use. Uh, but also, we can't, like, in our research or doing whatever, uh, in our region, we can't just eliminate Afghanistan. Because um, if we eliminate Afghanistan, okay, the economy there will be bad. But also it affects Pakistan, India, all, all our neighboring countries. But there's a plus point about Afghanistan. So the location of Afghanistan is like, it, it's just perfect. Because uh, it connects uh, energy rich uh, Central Asia to energy deficient South Asia. That's like, um, that could be used uh, like in our regional integration and uh, South Asian countries, uh, can all, including of course Afghanistan, can all benefit from uh, the location of uh, Afghanistan as transit hub between these two uh, Asian regions. Excellent. I think we have heard the voices from South Asia. And actually, uh, uh, if we want to, if, is there anyone who can make some point, what you like to make final comment? Rick, uh, you, you want to say something? Bobby. Sure, in the next one. So I'll, I'll save my really good points for that. Okay, so we keep those points. <laughs> uh, but I don't really want to summarize because I thought that it was a very, very uh, excellent session. You know, we've heard so many new issues, new ideas, and, and I think uh, these are very useful for the, uh, the research we'd like to conduct in the coming days. With this, I'd like to thank you all, and then we'll have a, a tea break until 11:30. We are 15 minutes behind, don't worry, we'll catch it up during the lunch break. Thank you. Awesome.